Therefore is a transitional adverb. It means things are going to change in the course of the writing. And most of the time it, it has to do with consequences, results of, because of that, now this. Uh, you'll read it a lot in the works and the writings of Paul. Uh, Ephesians is a great example. Uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians are about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. When he begins to talk about the practical application of what it means to live in faith, Paul at the beginning of chapter 4 writes this, Therefore, therefore I beg you, in view of God's mercy, live a life worthy of the calling that you have in Christ Jesus. Because of what Christ has done for you and for me, now therefore, consequence of, result of, live a life worthy of the calling. Now, chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews begins with this therefore, this transitional adverb. And it has to do with the results of, the consequences of what he's talked about in chapter 11. Chapter 11 is one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bibles. It's one of the greatest sermons ever written. And it begins with that famous verse, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Because of the way we view the future, because we believe that God has already completed our future in Jesus Christ, we live in anticipation of that future now. Now, the obvious question to the writer of Hebrews was, that's a great definition, but what does faith look like in real life? So he fills out the rest of chapter 11 with a hall of fame, a list of heroes of the faith. And all of the great men and women of the, of the Bible are listed in these passages. Abraham is listed, well, Abraham is listed three times. He's listed first when he heard the word of God to go to a new country, a new place where he hadn't been before. There, the writer of Hebrews tells us, so Abraham could receive a new inheritance. He's also mentioned when, uh, in, in his old age, God promise him, promises he and Sarah the birth of Isaac. And the writer of Hebrews, who is celebrating Abraham's faith, says that Abraham believed even though, and I quote, he was as good as dead. That's what his friends were saying about him. He's, he's celebrated because when God called Isaac, when called, God called Abraham to offer Isaac, Abraham, we're told, believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead if that was the way God had decided to work the faith of Moses when he confronted Pharaoh and demanded the release of the Hebrew slaves on how they walked in faith on dry ground across the Red Sea about how Joshua and his faith prayed and the walls of Jericho fell and Rahab, the prostitute who was in Jericho, saw what God was up to and threw her lot with the people of Israel. A little story there that reminds us that you're in never too big a mess or it is never too late to get with what God wants to do in your life. And on and on the list goes. There's Gideon, all the prophets, many of whom were martyred for the faith, were eaten by wild beasts who lived so close to God. We're told by the writer of Hebrews that the world was not worthy of them. And now this great host of witnesses now forms this cloud of witnesses. Let me give you the image that the writer of Hebrews is using. It's an image of a relay race that the first runner has run his lap and has now handed the baton to the second runner. The second runner has run her lap, and now she has handed the baton to the third runner who has completed their lap, and now they have handed the baton to us. And now, exhausted from their effort, they stand on the sidelines to see how well you and I will run. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 12. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. <laughs> therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so entangles us, so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. 
Consider him who endured such opposition from a sinful man that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My sons, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone that he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father, if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to our father of our spirits and lay up? Our father disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but is painful to endure. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. I love how the ESV translates these last two verses. Lift up your drooping hands. Strengthen your weak knees. Make your path straight so that what is lame will not be disabled, but rather healed. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Surrounded by such a great, great cloud, free us from everything that entangles us, and everything that hinders us, so that we, we, like so many before us, will run our race well. For this we pray. Amen. The writer of Hebrews is writing to a church undergoing some kind of persecutions. Now, scholars disagree and debate on where this persecution was happening and what level of the persecution was at. But we are addressing believers who are undergoing some kind of trial. And the writer of Hebrews has written this letter to encourage them to hang tough. To, to remember that there have been brothers and sisters who have suffered before you, and you, like them, are now being called to suffer with them. If you have been marked as a follower of Christ, the world will come against you. Mark it. Now, I know some of you think, well, I just want to kind of be a, 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 a sort of follower of Christ. I don't want to be crazy about it or a fanatic about it. When you turned off of Concord Road into this parking lot, the world marked you. So you might as well sit down front. They think you're a Christ follower. Now, a couple of things that this writer tells us. First, remember those who have gone before you. Remember those who have gone before you. You're not the first one to, uh, to endure hard times. You're not the first ones for the world to come against. We are the heirs. We are the direct descendants of a tough group of believers. Uh, we have come in line after some tough, tough people. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a world-famous German theologian. He was lecturing in America when World War II broke out and was begged, begged by his American friends not to return to Germany. He does. He returns. That's one of those who was in this great cloud of witnesses. People like Peter, who we believe was crucified upside down for the sake of the gospel. People like Paul, 
who we believe was beheaded in the Roman persecution. These are the men and women who make up these great stories that have brought the gospel to you and to me. And did you notice what the writer of Hebrews said? You haven't suffered yet to the point of, of shedding blood. You're not dead yet. Stop whining. If you want to talk about tough, let's talk about brothers and sisters who are in some Muslim countries who will meet in very closed settings lest the, the neighbors down the street find out there are Christians and come and attack them. We're not there. Unless we're like some of the brothers and sisters who in communist countries, before the fall of the Iron Curtain, would show up for worship and find their priest nailed to the walls of their church, crucified in front of them. You're not there yet. Neither am I. If you want to talk about tough, tough times, we can't even get in the conversation yet. I'm reminded of the conversation that Jeremiah, the great prophet, had with God in the 12th chapter of his book where he tells God how hard it is to be a prophet and how hard it is to proclaim his word when nobody is on his side. This is how God answers him. You have done well in the day of the foot soldier, but I'm sending the Calvary. What will you do then? You've done well in safe country, but if you trip in safe country, what are you going to do when I unleash the Jordan? How will you do in the tangles of that river? Jeremiah, you've done well in the easy times. What in the world are you going to do when it gets hard? When it really gets tough? We believe that we are now in a different time in America. We believe that we as Christians have now come under some kind of, well, if it's not persecution, then it is at least unwanted attention. Now, some of you keep shaking your head going, man, Mike, the world's changing. Let me be the one to tell you, it has changed. Past tense. We're already there. Let me give you two examples from just this past few days of reading. In a recent article in the, in the magazine, The New Yorker, there's an article on Francis Collins. Do you know who Francis Collins is? He was one of the leading scientists and researchers in the mapping of the human genome. He is a fabulous scientist. Uh, he's been appointed by President Obama to be the director of the National Institute of Health. It is a fabulous appointment. Uh, Francis Collins has a book called The Language of God, which is a brilliant read. Um, there is a lot of concern and opposition to the appointment of Dr. Collins. Do you know why? Because Francis Collins is a believer. The article in the New Yorker says that when Francis Collins was appointed, that the scientists around the world were deeply troubled that President Obama would appoint a Christian. Because they didn't think you could be a Christian and a scientist. Nothing wrong with his scientific qualifications. They are impeccable. The problem is Dr. Collins is a Christian. Wall Street Journal, a few days ago, has a story about the Ryder Cup team. Uh, the Ryder Cup is a golf tournament between the American golfers and European golfers. And it's become quite uh, competitive and kind of nasty lately because the Europeans think they invented golf and now Americans think we own it. And it's getting kind of nasty. The article was about team captain Corey Pavin. You know the issue? Not whether or not Corey Pavin is a good enough golfer to be the captain or not whether or not he appointed or he chose a team good enough to win the cup. The issue? Corey Pavin is a Christian. Many of the golfers who are on the team are born again Christians. The issue, can you be a Christian and a winner as the world defines winner? When you pulled in off of Concord Road, the world looked at you and said, you are one of them. You are a Christ follower. 
and like those before us, they will come against you. If you're not enduring hardship, if you're not being challenged, it's simply because the world does not recognize you as his. Now, Hebrews gives us a way to understand this. Endure hardship as discipline. Understand, when the world brings hard things to you and challenges them to you, it's the Father coming to you going, now I'm going to use this to make you more like my son. I'm going to use whatever the world brings against you, whatever challenge they bring against you, and I'm going to use it to fashion you. So do not be afraid of it, but welcome it and know that I'm going to continue to work in your life. So if they throw you in jail, that's okay. I'm going to use it. If they restrict the, your company and say you can't go anywhere or go here or go there, that's all right. I'm going to use it. I, but understand, I'm going to use it to discipline you. The word disciple is directly related to the word discipline. Now, we always assume that means pain. And we're no fans of pain. All of us know what it takes to lose weight. You don't eat what you like and you exercise till it hurts. There's no secret. Me, I like to talk about the things I shouldn't eat while I'm eating them. <laughs> and I like to go and watch people work out. <laughs> but if you're a follower of Christ, you ought to be able to tell me two things real fast. Two things. If I went and grabbed you by your neck and said, tell me two things, you'll be telling me two things real fast. One, where you're reading in the scripture and what you're learning. You ought to be able to tell me, I am reading this book. Here's what Jesus is teaching me. And two, you ought to be able to tell me what area of life, of your life, Jesus is working. Because if you belong to him, he is always removing, adding, mashing, kicking out, tearing off, putting in. He's always hammering you more and more into his likeness. Now, guess what? The more you look like Christ, the easier you are to recognize in the world. What does that mean? That means they're going to bring you more challenges, more trip-ups, more ways to get you off of track so that you take your eye off Jesus. Jesus is going to use that to make you more like him. Guess what? That brings you more hardship. The result is always more. More challenges, more like Christ. Harder road, more like Christ. So what do you do? You do two things. First, you let go of everything that keeps you from running as well as you can run. Now notice the two emphasis here. First, you let go of anything that hinders you. A lot of times we think this is bad things. I, I, I need to let go of this bad habit and that bad habit. That's part of it. But the first thing is to let go of those things that are good, but not best. Those things that you enjoy, there's nothing wrong with, but they occupy your time, they occupy your heart, they occupy your mind, and they take up space in your life where Jesus Christ needs to be. If it is good, but not of Christ, let it go. Second, drop your sin. Now notice how easily the writer of Hebrews says you need to do this. Shed your sin. Take it off, the way you take off a coat, the way, the way you would take off a weighted vest if you were running. You drop this. Now, a lot of times the mistake we make is that we focus on our sin. We, 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 we define some bad habit, some attitude, and we say, well, I'm a really bad person. Look at this, look at this. I really need to do something about this. I really need to do something about that. And you end up focusing on the negative, which ends up determining your life. Now, I've told you about this all the time. If I walk out of here and say, today I'm not going to eat an Oreo cookie, I promise you I'm not going to eat an Oreo cookie. No matter what you do, I'm not going to eat an Oreo cookie. I'm not going to twist it in half and lick out the cream first and then eat it. I'm not going to do that. What's in my head? Oreo cookie. What will soon be in my hand? <laughs> Oreo cookie. Whatever you hold in your head becomes what you are. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, here's the second part. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't let anything or anyone take your attention off of him for any reason, any length of time. Fix your eyes on 
Jesus use his model, use his teaching now to define and, 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 and conform to your own life. Transform your own life. The more I think about it, the more I'm going to become like him. I'm going to become an expert in Jesus. Now, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Outsider, says it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything. 10,000 hours playing an instrument. Uh, 10,000 hours studying computers or software or history or whatever. It's about 10,000 hours to become an expert. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I will give you the question to deal with. How many of us in this room have spent 10,000 hours studying Jesus so that we can become an expert in Jesus? How many of us have spent that kind of time so we can understand the meaning of his life, the purpose of his life, the meaning of his death on the cross, the meaning of his resurrection, and the hope that we have in him? Have you spent the kind of time so that you become an expert in Jesus? At the end of chapter 13 in the the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells his followers, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away. In the end of Revelation, John shouts out, Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The old hath passed away. The new heaven and the new earth are founded and based on and live in the words of Jesus Christ. Everything else goes away. Why in the world do you want to fill your heart, your head, your life with things that are not going to last? Only the words of Jesus last. Now, a lot of us, we want to spend time studying this religion and that religion. Some of us have the call to apologetics. God bless you. Study all you need to. Most of us need to focus on Jesus. Know the real thing. You can spot a fake. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Study Jesus all the time, every day, as long as you can take it. 10,000 hours to become an expert. Well, Mike, what about this? What about it? What about that? Or postmodern philosophy? It's all going to go away. Only Jesus remains. Fill your life, your head, your heart with him. Everything else, as Paul reminds us in Philippians, throw it out like garbage. One of my favorite novels of all time is written by a man named Graham Greene. It's called The Power and the Glory. The book is about a very bad priest. This priest is in Mexico and he's lousy. He's lousy at being a priest. He's not very committed to, to, to Christ. He, he's not very disciplined. Uh, he, he, he drinks too much. He's had a child out of wedlock. And now he's been arrested by the Mexican government who is wiping out every, every symbol, every vestige of religion in the land. They're going to shoot him, execute him, because he was a priest. And he was a bad priest. But they're going to shoot him just the same. So he wakes up the day of his execution And here's what he thinks. He felt only an immense disappointment because he had to go to God empty-handed with nothing done at all. It seemed to him that at that moment it would have been quite easy to have been a saint. It would have only needed just a little more self-restraint, a little more courage. But he knew now, at the end, that only one thing mattered, to be a saint, to be a Christ follower. In the end, only one thing matters, to be his. Let's pray together. Maybe as you bow your heads now, what you're dealing with and thinking about is this particular issue. And it may be even a good thing. And you realize it is now taking too much space in your life, and you now to release that. And I'm praying for you as you do that, because I have faced those choices. Those are some of the hardest ones to make. Not between good and bad. We do okay with that one. The ones we mess up are good and best, bad and worse. 
So I'm praying for you now as you struggle between good and best, that you will release what hinders you from running your best, your best race. For some of us, there is a serious issue of sin. It's a grudge, it's an attitude, it's a behavior that we won't let go. We nourish it in the, in the dark corner of our heart, thinking that we can hide it from everyone else. But don't you know, don't you know a seed of sin planted in the corner of your heart grows like kudzu? It will soon take up all of that space. It will soon take up all of your heart. You have to let that go. I'm praying for you now. For some of you, it's a matter of adding a new attitude or a new assignment. For some, it can be as simple as becoming a member of Britwood Baptist Church, and we'd love to have you part of our congregation. But for some of you, it's the first conversation you have about your relationship with Jesus Christ. You got lots of questions. That's okay. I'll be waiting for you back in a party. It's just across the floor you're there, and I'd love to have a chance to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got friends back there who are willing to pray for you. However you now need to respond to the love of Christ, he's waiting for you where you are.